does all of the coding for that evolution in that system have to be within the cell, or could the rest of the environment somehow provide okay. some of it? One of the things that Shapiro talks about is the, the incredible amount of information that the genome collects from the environment through various sensory mechanisms in order to decide how to rearrange this. Okay. Okay, it's gathering a lot of information and it's making an educated guess. Okay, now I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna introduce a new idea here. Um, in, in manufacturing, in quality control, there's a concept called Taguchi. Okay, now the, the reason Taguchi exists is if somebody um, figures out, uh, wants to try um, a bunch of different ways to make a dozen different parts in a car engine and they want the combination of parts that's most reliable, they could end up having to build 20,000 car engines to test every combination, which is completely impractical. And so uh, they de developed something called the Taguchi method, which allows you to sort of kind of test thousands of combinations by actually only testing 10 or 12 or 18, mm -hmm. okay? And there's this really interesting math where you test the 18 combinations, you take the results, you dump it into a spreadsheet and it, and it pops out. This is the optimum combination. You know, this part is number one and this part is number two. And, the, and it's it, an educated guess. It's a very educated guess and it tends to be right, okay? okay. I am gonna propose that the genome uses, uses models similar to Taguchi to make highly educated guesses and that the path from a single cell to human beings over three billion years was actually one of the shortest possible paths it could have possibly taken. There was a highly optimized path and that three billion years is very short considering what actually happened, mm -hmm. okay? Because time is your enemy, not your friend. Mm -hmm. With time, you, you have opportunities to corrupt the information and destroy the genome. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's the hypothesis. So, but you intrigued me a lot with that point. You quoted Shapiro as saying that a lot of information is, is uh, brought in from the environment. Yeah. So, yeah. And the genome uses that to make the educated guesses? Yes, and he, and he describes that. He describes all these sensory mechanisms, which they may come from, uh, from cells that are in the bloodstream. They could come from all kinds of places. And by the way, this is the exact process your immune system uses to develop resistance. Ah, okay, so that's It's the thing. same process. I mean, there's no way to predict what could try to attack your system. But as soon as there's an attack, your immune system will start rearranging information in its genome. It'll do this 100,000 splices thing until it finally finds the way to crack the code on the invading organism and kill them. And now it's got it programmed in. Mm -hmm. So the same way your immune system collects information from its environment and then adapts, that, that what I'm hypothesizing, that's a micro version of what happens in the Evolution. big macro world. Okay. Okay. And in the case of the immune system example, but back to back to the thing that's catching me, is the micro the invader was the piece of the environment. Yes. That influenced it. Yes. That it adapted to. Yes. So it was information from the outside that it that it adapted to. Right. Likewise, you're saying that holds here in the larger macro right. version. And so, so out in the jungle and out on the savanna, I think that the animals and the plants, they're all taking in information from their highly competitive environment and the genome is adapting. So that could actually appear random because there's so, it's, there's so many variables here. Right, to, to an uneducated person, it, yeah, it seems like it could be random, but it's anything but random. Just like, you know, the, the progress from the first MP3 player to the iPod, you know, it's kind of zigzaggy and there's right. all these different things, but 
and, and there's a lot of dead ends and there's products that never panned out and all of that. Right. But it's actually very calculated right. as it goes. Right. So Shapiro says, and I, I agree, and I, that the genome is intelligent mm -hmm. in some sense. I don't know exactly in what sense, mm -hmm. but the genome, it's willfully trying to get to a goal. And you used the word algorithm. There's yes. an algorithm that captures that. Right. Right, and that again, works. I think the word algorithm might even be a little short of describing. But willfully it. implies a being, right? A, well, uh, it does. In the genome, you know, how do you encapsulate that into the genome? Um, I, it's an open question. Yeah, it's an open. But, but, I I want to make the most charitable assumptions that I can, because I think that will maximize discovery. What if you hypothesize that the genome is like willful almost in the way that an animal or, you know, so. Yeah, okay, earlier you put up a list of five, of five options and a couple of those were like aliens or humans, right? They, right. Those were willful. Yeah. And those, we kind of dismiss those, right? Because it doesn't answer the problem. You just, it just step, takes it back a step, right? Well, how did the alien get here? We, we always end up with a first step. Right. And I think the first step is obviously very impressive. Whatever was that there. That was the singularity. Right. So if there's a will, there, if there's a willful component to this, that you still takes you back to the first step of the singularity. That's where the yeah. will, okay. Right, right. And it, it always implies, there. it always implies that it was put there willfully by some external agent. Okay. Right.